Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with the Watchman Pure Bible Study. Got my uh, swine flu shot here, although it's uh, I've, I've changed my formula. This is not coffee. This is uh, tea. You Brits will be happy about that. This is warm tea. Um, <clears throat> I've been kind of ill, but I haven't had the swine flu, but uh, everybody else in my family has, and so I appreciate everybody praying for them. But uh, let me get a good dose of swine flu shot here. Uh, you know, that tea just does have something a little bit that coffee doesn't have. Anyway, good to be with you this morning. I had, had a busy week being sick and uh, trying to get some things done. And, and uh, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to our Bible study today. Second Peter chapter 1 is where we still are. And uh, man, I, don't, I don't know, we'll get out of here one of these days. Anyway, let's just plow through the Word of God this morning. Second Peter chapter 1. Uh, I want to pick it up in verse 12. He says, uh, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. <clears throat> the, um, the obligation of a good pastor, of a good preacher, good, a good Bible teacher, or, or a Bible study group leader, <clears throat> the, the, the responsibility that they have is to lead people into reminding them of things, uh, to stirring up their remembrance. If you remember... He said in verse 9, he said, He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. One of the things that, a theme that you can see clearly in the Bible is that God did not want his people forgetting things. He didn't want them to forget uh, that they came out of bondage. So he instituted Passover. He wanted them to remember that because at a later time it was going to be important that they knew that. <clears throat> so the institution of the Passover, uh, God told them every year, this is what I want you to do every year. I want you to have the Passover. And so they did from the time that, that Moses was around until the time Jesus came along and fulfilled the Passover. Uh, they had done these things every year. And if you remember what Jesus said, and we have that on the, on the front of our church, we have a communion table. And on the front of that communion table, it's sort of customary that they write this on communion tables that says, this do in remembrance of me. And this is what Christ said when he was having the Passover with his disciples. And he was breaking the bread and giving them the cup. And he was explaining to them exactly what it was. He said, now, do you, do you, you know, this Passover thing you've done all your life. You've done it since you were a little child. You grew up in a house where they did it every year, sort of like Christmas or something like that. They do it every year. And uh, you never did really know what this bread represented. Well, I'm going to tell you this bread is me. It's my body, which is broken. This vine, this fruit of the vine, this cup that I'm giving you, you've drank this before. Now you're going to know exactly what it means. And so he said to them, he gave them a commandment, as oft as ye do it, this do in remembrance of me. Um, and so we remember the things that God has done for us. We remember the things that we have read. And every now and then, we need to be reminded of the things that we had learned before, the things that we have, uh, the things that God has shown us before. Uh, I, uh, I'm not very diligent at it, but I try to keep notebooks of, of when I study. And uh, if, <clears throat> if you've seen sort of my lifestyle, I got, I got a notebook over here and I got six or seven over here and I got one in my briefcase and I've got, I mean, I've got notebooks laying all over the place, uh, scattered everywhere to the four winds. Um, but I try, to, I try to jot down, I keep some on my, on my computer, I try to jot down things that I've studied, things that I've learned, things that I, that I want to remember because I know that I'll forget them. It's kind of like the list my wife gives me. Uh, I know I'm going to forget it. So anyway, um, every now and then I'll go back through these notebooks and I'll, and I'll read something that I had forgotten about. That's, uh, to putting, that's putting things in remembrance. He said, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. The, the responsibility of a good pastor, a good teacher, a good Bible study leader is to, is to remind people of the things of the Word of God. The teacher... <clears throat> this is important. This is where we. This is where. This is where the church has gone off. Okay. This is where they've gone astray. The, it's never the preacher that is to be the focus of the sermon. It's not that. Uh, I don't care if it's doctor so and so. I mean, I don't care. The preacher or the teacher is never to be the focus of the sermon or the lesson or the study. The word of God is, and so. 
And that's important because I'm going to show you something here in a little bit. Um, I'm having trouble talking this morning. I, you know, just walked in this morning. It's early morning. <clears throat> I need another sw uh, swine flu shot here, so hang on. I don't know if I could get away with stuff like this on national broadcast television, but it's just us, so let's just deal with it, all right? <clears throat> but anyway, the, the pastor is never to be the focus of the sermon. It's to be the Word of God. His responsibility is to not always give you some new thing. You know, that's what the Athenians wanted in the book of Acts. They always wanted some new thing. And so people flocked to the megachurches, to the big um, charismatic tent revivals, because they want to see the new thing that's come out. They want to see the new, the new outpouring, the new, um, the new deal that they're going to put up on the stage, the new drama, the new skit they're going to play, the new sex talk that they're going to give in church. People want everything new. Jeremiah told us to walk, seek ye out the old paths and walk therein. And uh, every now and then we need to remember where those old paths are. We need to remember um, where they are. We need, to, we need to have these things stirred up in our minds. So he says, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established. And here I like this. Be established in present truth. Now, I went to Bible college. And the Bible colleges I went to, and I made some good friends there, uh, the Bible colleges I went to, fairly conservative. I didn't go to um, some liberal college that says, ah, let's not study the Bible. Um, I went to fairly conservative Bible colleges. The, the, the thing that I got <clears throat> out of those colleges was that the Bible... The Word of God, the collection of the 66 books of the, the canon of the Scripture, that those things were, were perfect. They were absolutely infallible. They were totally without error a long, 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 long time ago. Way, way back. Okay, uh, If you want to go to the, uh, what scholars think is the oldest book of the Bible would be, would be the book of Job. Uh, Job more than likely was a contemporary of Abraham, so it was written about that time. And uh, so you're talking about a, a book that is um, about 4,000 years old. And they say that, you know, when Job wrote it, it was perfect. Well, of course it was perfect. It's the Word of God. Um, when David wrote the Psalms, they were, they were perfect back then. But these same teachers, philosophers, Bible scholars. The Bible's not perfect now. How can you say that? How can you say that the Bible's perfect now? Well, I can say it because that's what the Bible says. And they say, we believe in the infallible, the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures, which means God inspired every word, and I believe that, in the original manuscript. So here's what they're saying that the original manuscripts, which don't exist anymore, there are no original, we do not have the parchment, the vellum, the rock, anything. We don't have anything like that of what the original writers wrote on when they wrote the Word of God. We have copies. And so they say, we believe in the truth of the Word of God as it was a long time ago. But in saying that, they are saying they won't admit it publicly. But they, they might, but they won't, they won't come out in a doctrinal statement and say, we believe the Bible's full of mistakes right now. It has to be. Of course it is. So they're saying that truth used to be, but it's not now. And I don't care if it's, if it's one little discrepancy, they say, between 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. I don't care. They say, well, you know, we see <clears throat> mistakes in the Bible. Translators made errors. We know that copyists didn't copy everything right. We know all these things. And so we believe in a truth that used to be, but it's lost now. You know, that kind of sounds to me like uh, the lost word of Freemasonry. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a minute if I get time today. Um, but anyway, the idea that the Bible is not now present truth is a lie. If, if you are under a pastor or I have been under a pastor or a teacher uh, or, or reading websites that are telling you that uh, the King James cannot be, it's, there's no way the King James can be inspired. It's a translation. 
God never knew how to spoke English. He only knew Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. They'll tell you that, that the Bible is not inspired. It contains errors in it. And so therefore, it, it this Bible, and I, I, I just don't get this. This Bible right here cannot be trusted to give you the whole truth. Now, that man up on the pulpit, he went to Bible college and he studied all these things and he knows Greek letters and, yeah, and, and he knows a little Hebrew and so he can tell you, I mean, he'll give you the truth, right? Where has that gotten us? The idea that putting the pastor in charge of, of, of the pastor, the Bible teacher, whoever, or the website uh, in charge of your eternal life, uh, you'll see that nowhere in the scriptures. Uh, the Bible is the present truth. This Bible that I have right now is the present truth. It's not just past truth. It's not just what used to be true. It is true right now. It is true from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. There is no error in here whatsoever. I teach a lot of Bible numbers. One of the numbers that you need to, the most important Bible number that you need to know for your eternal salvation is zero because that's how many mistakes there are in this book. There are absolutely no mistakes in here whatsoever. It is the book of present truth. And Peter is saying here that you be established in the present truth. I, my faith is not based upon something that meant something a long time ago, but doesn't mean that today. That's not where my faith is. My faith and my trust and my confidence is in a book that right now <clears throat> has been has been of old, has been preserved, has been translated and transmitted to me without error. It is not the incorrupt Word of God. It is the incorruptible Word of God. It cannot be corrupted. You cannot corrupt the Word of God. It has to be present truth. And so my eternal salvation is based upon the fact that this book cannot change. And it was then, it is now, and always will be the same. Um, those who, um, and there's, there's a, you know, the whole Southern Baptist Convention, <clears throat> they go around, they really like themselves, and I'm not knocking all Southern Baptists, but they go around telling everybody, they have, I mean, they have, they, Southern Baptists probably have more scholars than any denomination in the whole world. And, uh, and uh, all these Bible colleges, Southern Baptist Bible colleges are churning out these guys, who are telling everybody, yes, you are eternally secure in your salvation. No, the Bible is not eternally secure in what it says. That's what they're saying to you. They're saying to you that you have a salvation that cannot be taken away and cannot be broken, and yet they say you have a Bible that has been broken many times. Well, I can tell you that God promised, God promised, Jesus himself promised that not one jot or one tittle of this book would pass until all be fulfilled. And so my salvation hinges upon the fact that this Bible is present truth. Verse 13, yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So that's the second time he says that. Verse 12, he says to put you always in remembrance of these things. Uh, verse 13, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. A job of a pastor, a preacher, or a teacher is to stir people up with the Word of God, um, to, to get them to think, to provoke them to thought and meditation on the Word of God, to uh, not, just, not always just teach them something new that they may not have learned before, but to give them something old, to give them something added to that for them to think about, to, to ponder a little bit, to stir up in their remembrance. God does not want us forgetting the Word of God. He doesn't want us forgetting these old things because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you in a little bit what will happen when you start forgetting things, when you start forgetting the Word of God, when you start forgetting that the Bible is truth, has no error in it, when you, when you start forgetting that the Bible is totally accurate 100% and it is the way to salvation and it teaches the truth of God, when you start forgetting these things, I'm going to show you what happens here in just a few minutes. So he says, I think it means as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ 
has showed me. You know, that's a, that's a uh, I can tell you by experience, it is a surreal thing uh, to ponder uh, death. It, it really is. Um, and a lot of you know my testimony a few years ago, I was electrocuted um, and was prepared to die. I mean, I was, I was making plans to die all in the space of about a minute. And um, it's a surreal thing to think about your death being that imminent, to be, of being that way. Um, it's, it's just really, it's hard to describe if you've never been through it. Soldiers who've come back from the battlefield can tell you about this. Uh, maybe other people can, but it, it's an odd thing. And, um, and here is Peter. He's, the Lord has already showed him uh, the manner of his death and, and his, you know, uh, things like that. And Peter, Peter remember, he, says, he remembers that. He's had that stirred up in his mind. And so now he's thinking, this is his last letter here, his last epistle. He's thinking about this. And um, he's, wanting to, he's wanting to give his testimony. He's wanting to give his words of admonition because uh, he knows that he's not going to be around very long. And so he wants to leave them with something that will hold them even though he's dead and gone. I remember years ago I was preaching a, uh, a youth camp. I was preaching uh, uh, some to, to kids at a youth camp. And I was just preaching, man. I was just, you know, how I do. I just was preaching to them. And uh, they were eating it up. Um, and I was praying all throughout the week, Lord, you know, the, the last sermon's coming up Thursday night. The last sermon's coming up. What am I going to tell these kids? You know, some of these kids, they come to camp. They come to Bible camp, but they won't, they won't be in church after this. Um, and some of them you just look at and you just love and you wish above all things, that you could just take them in and raise them uh, in a good, decent home. And you can't do that. And uh, so, I mean, I was just really struggling over this. And finally, after, after praying about it, God said, uh, give them the word. Give them the book. And so the last sermon that I preached to them was I preached about uh, the word of God, the Bible. Uh, because I knew that even though I couldn't watch over them, I knew that even though their, maybe their pastor, whose church they came with, couldn't watch over them, I knew that God could. And I knew that even if they couldn't get to church, they could get to their Bible. And that was, man, I'm going to say that was 10 years ago. And I'm telling you that I believe that there's some grown-up kids right now in their early 20s that at some point, if they haven't already, are turning back to this book. I had a pastor come up to me after the message just crying. And this is not me. This is from the Lord. But he was just crying and he said, You have reinvigorated my faith in the book, in the Word of God. And he, and he told me, Thank you. And that's what Peter wanted to do, is he wanted to get them turned back to the Word of God. So he says in verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always, here it is again, in remembrance, in remembrance. This is why I think that it's important that a Christian, uh, and not just someone who says, oh, I believe in Jesus, a, a real Christian is someone who is devoted, dedicated to a study of the Word of God. This is something that they do. They read the Word of God, and then they go read it again, and all of a sudden things click, and God puts things together, and... and um, you see the joining together of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you see Christ and all these things. And then you go back and read it, and you remember things that you read, and now that you've learned something different, God puts them together, and you go, wow, you know, just those things. And so Peter is thinking about his own death, and he's, he's going to give them something here that we, that we won't get to today. I've been waiting for this one. Um, but he's going to give them something that will last them far beyond his decease. Um, some good old preachers have come on the scene over the years, some godly men that loved this Bible. They loved the Lord. They were men of prayer. They were men of uh, fervent preaching. They were soul winners. They were, they were just men who, they were sinners, but they were men who believed the Bible. They have gone off the scene. They have died, but the Word of God has remained for a new generation. A new generation comes along and it establishes itself in present truth. And then they go away and a new generation comes along. But the solid stableness, steadfastness of those, this whole operation is the Word of God. And this is what Peter's going to leave them. 
He says in verse 15, moreover, moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. This is what I wanted to get to today. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now I want you to think about this cunningly devised fables. I wrote a note here. The word cunningly devised, uh, these are, my teacher told me that these were, um, actually cunningly is an adverb that modifies devised, but these are like an adjective to show you what the fables were, the kind of fables. I hope I'm getting this right. After 15 years of running a Christian school, I ought to be able to get this at least close to right. Cunningly means um, methodically, secretly. Uh, if someone is cunning, they are subtle. That's another word for subtle. So here we have subtly or cunningly devised. These fables have an agenda to them. They have, a, um, they have a plan when they, when they teach you these stories. Um, let, me get, let me get to this. Um, here is Dan Brown's lost symbol. And here is um, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. Uh, somebody, very well-meaning, wrote me an email and said I shouldn't have all these books around me. And uh, I, I will say I don't encourage everybody to read you know, Morals and Dogma. Uh, but I believe God has, has led me to read this. I've read practically most of this book. Uh, oh, look, there's our friend, the right angle triangle. Um, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I had to learn that uh, in studying all this. This is the sons of God and the daughters of men, and this is their son, uh, the sun god or the antichrist or the new man. That's, that's what that means. Um, and the double-headed eagle on here uh, is a picture of two heads facing in opposite directions, and they're both fused into one body. And Albert Pike says in here that this is the, the male principle, this is the female principle, this is the opposites joined together in one body. So that's Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. The number 33, I can talk about that all morning. And God has shown me all these things because, because I decided that this book is true and this book is not true. This book is a book of cunningly devised fables. And one of the interesting things that you get when you read um, Morals and Dogma uh, is that you, you hear um, Albert Pike talk a lot about um, Osiris and Adonis and um, Hercules and Apollo. Um, you hear him talk, and Isis, you hear him talk a lot about all of these sun god figures that um, were killed and then lay in a grave and then, then they were resurrected. You hear that, I mean, that is, that is all through here. Manly Hall's secret teachings of all ages. I mean, he deals a lot with the god who has been murdered and lays in a tomb and then is resurrected. Um, there's uh, some ideas floating around that are, that are kind of, and, and Dan Brown's part of this, and I'll get to him in a second. They're, they're, they're trying to convince people. They're trying to convince people. And I, and I saw the first part of this video going around on the internet called, I think it's Zeitgeist or something like that. And I haven't seen all of it, but I saw the first part of it. And basically, they're trying to tell you that if you believe in Jesus, why, you just believe in Osiris. I mean, there's no difference. I mean, that's, you know, Peter and John got together and they said, hey, you know this guy, uh, you know, the sun god? Let's make that into Jesus. And let's, yeah, yeah. So, okay, Jesus, okay, he was killed. And uh, let's see, he, let's see, he lay in a tomb for three days and then he rose from the dead. Yeah, that's what we'll, yeah, that's what we'll tell everybody. And we'll have this big religion. We'll have power over everybody. And we'll have money. And we'll have lots of women. And then that's what they want you to believe. They want you to believe that, that we have followed cunningly devised fables. That the religion that you and I have is simply nothing more than just a regurgitation of the Osiris death cult. Or as you read in Ezekiel chapter 8, um, the, the women weeping over Tammuz. Tammuz was the, the murdered god who is going to be resurrected. And, um, and so we, we just follow cunningly devised fables. Morals and Dogma was written with an agenda. Our, uh, uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages, Manly Hall, was written with agenda. This was written with an agenda. 
It is a cunningly devised fable trying to lead people. And, I, and I've told people, what, what, did, you, did you read uh, The Lost Symbol? Yes, I read uh, all of it, made notes of it. What would you think of it? I'd say 500-page brochure for Freemasonry and a, um, a sort of Bible to reveal the Antichrist. That's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that that's what this is all about. And so uh, this is a cunningly devised fable. If you remember uh, Dan Brown before this, he wrote Angels and Demons. And on top of Angels and Demons, the premises, the things he was researching then, he then wrote the Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code is uh, Jesus had a wife named Mary Magdalene and they had a child. Okay? Well, that is a cunningly devised fable that is based upon... Um, uh, um, Osiris, the sun god, and Isis joining together and producing a child named Horus, who's the Antichrist or the savior of mankind. And um, that's what the Da Vinci Code was all about. And then Dan Brown takes it the next level, because Freemasons go in levels, it takes it the next level and brings it home to us in Washington, D.C. And we're, I'm working on a video right now called Capital Secrets. It's going to show you some things about Washington, D.C. and other places. But these are all cunningly devised fables. And uh, there are people who will read the Da Vinci Code uh, who were sort of teetottering whether or not they wanted to believe the, the Christian account of Jesus Christ. And they'll read the Da Vinci Code and go, yeah, I thought that. <laughs> you know, I, okay, I'm not going to be a Christian. I, I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to believe the Bible. You know, the Bible is written by men. You know, Dan Brown said the Bible is written by men. And, um, you know, that God didn't actually write anything. Dan Brown said that. And so they're going to believe that, and they'll believe that, and they'll die and go to hell. Then people are going to read this one. They're going to believe, and, and the lost symbol, the interesting thing about the lost symbol, uh, <clears throat> Dan Brown says that the lost symbol is the King James Bible. And he says that the, the uh, fundamental Christians, uh, we, uh, you know, we've taken the Bible way too seriously. I mean, to literally believe the Bible? Nobody, nobody believes that anymore. You can't just literally believe the Bible, can you? Well, I do. But Brown says, oh, the Bible was never, never meant to be understood literally. It's an allegory. You know what that word means? It's a fable. It's a myth. The cunningly devised fables. And, you know, <clears throat> Dan Brown here, he's got cunningly devised fables. Harry Potter was a cunningly devised fable. The Lord of the Rings, cunningly devised fables. And there are teachers, there are preachers, and Sunday school writers, and all these people who are saying, you know, you know, you can you can see Jesus in the Lord of the Rings. You know, Gandalf, the wizard. You know, the guy that God said you're not supposed to follow a wizard. Well, Gandalf is Jesus. You know, because he dies. He, let's see, he dies and he's in the tomb, and then he's resurrected again and changed in form. See, you can see Jesus there. No, that's a cunningly devised fable. And um, here's, here's what Paul or Peter's getting at here, and I'm going to close with this. There's a, there's, a, uh, there's a war going on. There's a war going on between fantasy and truth. The truth will expose the fantasy. The fantasy, however, will never reveal the truth. It never will. These two things are opposite. This is light. This is darkness. And God said, get it? God said, let there be light. Four words, four gospels. And there was light. And here, this is darkness. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. All of masonry, all of the, all of the mystery religions say, oh no, no, they refuse together because there's a little truth in all lies and a little lies in all truth. That sounds like modern Bible scholarship, don't you think? Uh, yeah, there's certainly there's a, little, there's a few errors in the, in the Bible. That's a cunningly devised fable. And um, woe be to the person who accepts the lie over the truth. But I'm going to read something real quick. 
and I'm going to get out of here and finish my swine flu shot here. Um, pray for my family. They, uh, they, boy, they've been under it. But we haven't needed Obama to come in and rescue us. Praise the Lord. Um, the Bible says that uh, concerning the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed. This is going to reveal him, by the way. Uh, actually, this is, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And I'll be honest with you, people will sit for hours and read this. Oh, it's a point, they call it a page turner. Boy, it's a real page turner. Man, I, once I started reading, I couldn't put it down. Okay? They love not the truth. And because the love, they don't love the truth, they won't be saved. And then he says, and for this cause, for this cause right here, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They are definitely, this is the setup is what this is. This is setting everybody up to believe the lies that are being told today. All right, when we get into next week, and I appreciate you bearing with me. I've had a busy schedule, been sick, been traveling, and so I haven't put everything out the way I wanted to. But uh, when we get into it, the next, I believe next week, we're going to get into that. Oh, I can't wait. Verse 18 and 19, the sure word of prophecy. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. You have a great week. We'll see you later on sometime. God bless you. Bye-bye.